a nutritionist. She's doing some of the admin behind the scenes thing. So I see she's letting, letting you in. She said, we're good to go. So hi everyone, thank you for joining. And uh, I'm really happy that you're here tonight to learn a little bit about how to balance your blood sugar. So if there are questions during the lecture, please uh, list them in your chat section. So I will check the chat at the end of the lecture and go through and answer any and all of your questions to the best of my ability at the end of the class. Um, so I see some names that I recognize. So thank you for attending and we will go ahead and get started. So as you already know, today we are here to discuss decreasing your risk and balancing your blood sugar. And I know some of you, and I may not know some of other ones of you. My name is Dr. Nicole Dodona, and I am a naturopathic doctor. And what a naturopathic doctor is, is we are trained in anatomy, physiology, biochem, pathology, so a lot of your basic sciences, just like a regular medical doctor, but it's our training and our philosophy that is really different. So really, we are trying to treat the underlying causes, try to use the least invasive, most natural products first, and ideally prevent things before they happen. So today we'll talk a little bit about where that prevention comes in and where that treatment comes in. Um, so really trying to really use natural items, get to the root cause, and really live lives of optimal health. And I am here at the Sklar Center for Restorative Medicine. And one of our missions is to help educate, uh, educate people, uh, patients and others, to uh, live their optimal lives. So we're gonna today look at sugar and we're gonna look at what diabetes actually is and the physiology of blood sugar and what happens when we eat carbohydrates and sugar and how that leads to elevated glucose and insulin, and what that does in our body. We're gonna look at, are you at risk or not? And then really what we also wanna talk about is what you can do about it. Because you know, I love information and I think information is power and knowledge, but the really big thing is, is taking action and what can you actually do about it? So diabetes, and today we're really talking about type two diabetes, which is uh, diabetes based on insulin resistance. And so diabetes is a disease state where our body for some reason is no longer able to respond to insulin properly. And insulin is the hormone that brings glucose into our cells. Glucose is also called blood sugar. We'll go over that a few times so get sick of me hearing me say that. Um, so what happens is our body can't really get that glucose out of the bloodstream anymore. And now it's floating around in there and it can be excreted in our urine or do damage throughout our body. So the question I want you to think about as we go through these slides is, do you have to have diabetes before you might suffer some of the negative results of having high blood sugar? So glucose is also called blood sugar, and I will use those terms interchangeably. So we eat foods that are high in sugar or carbohydrates. It increases our blood sugar, and then our blood sugar needs to get into our cells. And insulin is the hormone that brings our blood sugar into the cell. Here we have insulin. It sits on the receptors. And then once that insulin sits on the receptors, a whole cascade of stuff happens. And then it brings this transporter here called GLUT4 transporter to the cell membrane surface, which allows glucose into the cell. In this picture, it is a much more complicated version of what is happening. So it's really the same thing that here's our insulin receptor. All this stuff happens down here, brings GLUT4 receptor to the cell surface, which then allows glucose to enter the cell. And the importance of glucose is that really we need glucose for every function pretty much in our body. Almost every cell requires glucose in order to function. And it's definitely utilized by our mitochondria, which are the parts of our cells that make our cellular energy. Um, and it really, our brains need glucose, our heart need glucose, our skeletal muscles need glucose. Pretty much every cell in our body needs glucose. So insulin travels around our body looking for glucose in our bloodstream so that it can attach and then let it into the cell. And our body is really about balance. And so we don't want too high of 
for glucose, we don't want too low of glucose. Really, we want balanced glucose. And our body has mechanisms in place that help to keep that in balance. So if our blood sugar gets too low, it uh, uses stored sugar in the form of glucagon and brings our blood sugar up. If there's not enough glucagon or if there's another need, we can actually create our own glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis. And so that is really our underlying chemistry producing more glucose because really we don't want our blood sugars to drop too low because then our body can't function, our cells won't work. So we really need to keep a nice even level of glucose through in our blood. The problem is, is in our modern world, we consume too much energy, and that is usually in the form of sugar and carbohydrates. And over time, our body is trying to keep balance, trying to keep balance, but at some point, our bodies break down and it's no longer able to keep that balance, and that's when we start getting those elevated blood sugars. And the question is, how do you know if this process is happening to you? So we're going to take a quiz. So we're gonna look at this, sugar assessment A. So just kind of take mental note which ones sound like you. You have to eat every two hours. You crave sweets throughout the day. You get hangry. Hangry is that hungry and angry and irritable if you miss a meal. And I'd say it's pretty common for a lot of people. Uh, do you suffer brain fog, especially? This is usually in the late afternoon, that three o'clock drop. You might need sugar. You might need to go drive through and get that, well, now it's definitely drive through right now. Go get that Starbucks, something to give you that pick me up, usually in that late afternoon. Sometimes maybe you might wake with brain fog and you can't really function until you get that sweet kind of in your body. So see how many of those you answered yes to. And then we're gonna see how many of these you answered yes to. So for section B, what happens is you get hungry, you eat, you feel great, you have sustained energy throughout the day. Answer yes, if that sounds like you. You sleep all the way through the night, you don't wake up, and you have good blood pressure, cholesterol, and your heart is in good health. So if you answered yes to those in B, then yay, good for you. That is healthy blood sugar. That sound, those are what should happen in our body. That is what happens when we have nice, stable blood sugar. We should eat, get hungry, eat, move on. Really, that's it. We shouldn't really have all these negative symptoms associated with eating or not eating. If we skip a meal, we should be fine. We should be able to get through our day. You know, if we don't have time to eat, you know, we'll eat a little bit later. Our body will go either into that gluconeogenesis. It'll make some blood sugar. Maybe we're actually burning fat for fuel. Our body will make something called ketones. It should keep your blood sugar nice and stable. You should be able to move on and not really have too many issues. One of the reasons why that happens for people is by eating healthy protein and fat. Protein and fat are really what are gonna keep our blood sugar stable. So if you answered yes to a lot of those on A, well then, unfortunately, it sounds like you're probably on what's called a blood sugar roller coaster. And unlike other roller coasters, the blood sugar roller coaster is really not very much fun. So what happens is we eat foods that are high in sugar or carbohydrates and our blood sugar spikes. So we're going up, 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 up on that roller coaster, right? And is it even just obvious sugar like a cupcake? No, even foods that are high in carbohydrates like pasta, bread, and rice, that can still spike our blood sugar as well. And so then what happens is our blood sugar is going up and then whoosh, our blood sugar goes down. Sometimes for people it goes down like in this roller coaster and goes way down really fast and you get quick symptoms. Other times it usually takes about two hours. Two hours after you eat, you start to maybe get a little headachey, start looking for your next carbohydrate fix. That's very typical with low blood sugar drops. So really, people think, oh, I have low blood sugar. I don't have a problem with, like, with diabetes. I'm not going to get diabetes. My blood sugar is actually low. And really, low blood sugar is actually the first symptom of dysregulated blood sugar. So if you are having these, then you're early in the course of dysregulated blood sugar but it is telling you that something is going wrong in your body's capacity to deal with blood sugar. And so now would be the time to really fix that. If you are one of those dippers, one of the most important things is to get enough chromium. And foods that contain chromium are, one of the highest ones is broccoli. And so per cup of broccoli, there's 35 milligrams, or 11 micrograms, I'm sorry, and 35 is the RDA. 
So you need about three cups of broccoli a day. So as I go through this, you'll hear me talk about a lot of vegetables because I am a big fan of vegetables. That's really where we get a lot of our nutrition from is all those veggies. So other vegetables that contain chromium are things like romaine, lettuce, green beans, even mushrooms contain quite a bit or a decent amount. They're not high in any one food. Um, it's in trace amounts in, in a lot of different foods. If you are already exhibiting signs of low blood sugar, you may actually need more in order to bring your body back into balance. So supplements are not always our first choice. Food is definitely the first option. Um, but if you're finding that food is not enough to stabilize your blood sugar, you can get chromium as a supplement. And I put the specific form here. So not all supplements are created equal. And whenever you have a mineral, it has to be attached to something in order to be shelf stable in a supplement. So the form here, this chromium polynicotinate, that form is a very usable form of chromium. And it's also nicknamed GTF or glucose tolerance factor because that form plays a specific role in supporting blood sugar. So once you eat that food and then maybe it drops and then over time, if you're going up and down and up and down for a long time, your body's trying to compensate, you're bringing insulin in, it's trying to get glucose into the cell, you're needing more and more insulin, the insulin goes up and up and up, it takes more insulin to bring that glucose into the cell, and eventually that insulin can no longer do its job and you end up with blood sugar that's high in the blood. So here's normal. Our pancreas is actually the organ that secretes insulin. It secretes insulin, it goes into our blood vessel, the insulin receptor, insulin sits on the receptor, GLUT4 transport, uh, transporter goes to the surface and glucose goes in. Here's what happens in type two diabetes. Our pancreas still secretes insulin. We might have insulin, we might even have a lot of insulin sitting out here and a lot of insulin here. And then pretty soon there's the insulin sitting, it's trying to do its job, more and more insulin's being secreted in order to get those uh, glucoses in. But eventually the glucose really doesn't go in anymore. The cells become resistant to all that insulin levels out there. And what that looks like inside of your bloodstream is here's normal. We have, you know, there's some insulin, there's some red blood cells. If we're a dipper, not that much insulin. And what happens in hyperglycemia is that insulin really can't get that glucose into the cell anymore. And so it requires more and more insulin in order to get the job done. And what that does, that insulin resistance, it actually creates a level of inflammation in the body. And some of you may have heard that chronic inflammation is actually at the root of almost every chronic illness. And often there are a two-way street. So when we have insulin resistance, it creates inflammation. And when we have inflammation, it also creates insulin resistance. So these two go back and forth and they really work in concert and really perpetuate each other. And so when we have this chronic inflammation, it doesn't just affect the sugar, it affects many other things going on in our body. One, our cells can't get the energy that they need. Two, we might be building up plaque on the inside of our arterial walls, leading to things like cardiovascular disease. Maybe we're gaining fat around our abdomen, increasing that um, internal fat. Um, that is not good for our livers. Maybe it's getting uh, destroying our beneficial bacteria in our gut because we are actually more bacteria than we are human. We have more uh, gut bacterial DNA than we have human DNA. Um, and it also that chronic inflammation and high blood sugar are increasing oxidative stress. So the other thing that high blood sugars do is when that we have that extra glucose floating around in our bloodstream, that glucose can then attach to things. And often most of our body is made up of protein. So it attaches to that protein. And when it does that, it changes the formation of that protein. So proteins are really driven by their structure. So the structure of a protein dictates its function. And when you have a glucose attaching to a protein, it then changes that structure of that glucose and that protein. And so now you have what's called an advanced glycation end product. And these advanced glycation end products, kind of like the blood sugar floating all through your body, this is one of the reasons why it affects so many organs, is that structural change in the protein affects proteins in your brain, in your heart, in your joints, in your lung, in your liver, in your kidneys, in your eyes, basically any place in our body that has protein, which is pretty much 
most things throughout our body, can get these glycated, glycated proteins, and then that affects the function of that protein. So some of you have had blood work before, especially if you're a patient here, since we test this all the time. So there's a blood test called a hemoglobin A1C. And what a hemoglobin A1C actually is, is it is a direct measurement of how many hemoglobins, which is in the red blood cell, how many of those proteins have been attached to a glucose. So because a red blood cell lives for 120 days or three months, the level of hemoglobin A1C or how many of these red blood cells, the hemoglobin has a glucose attached to it is a direct reflection of how high your blood sugar has been over those previous three months. So these advanced glycation end products, they can attach to any protein in our body. And one common thing that they attach to are our collagen proteins in our skin. So definitely as we get older, one of the things that those high glucose, that glycated end products do is lead to things like wrinkles. It actually uh, also leads to thickening of walls in our blood vessels, which can lead to things like hypertension. And it can increase, if it in, uh, attaches to the proteins in our eye, it can lead to cataracts. So I mentioned that really diabetes, because of those glucoses attaching to proteins all throughout the body, that's really one of the main reasons why we see it have so many sequelae, so many different parts of our body that are affected by these high glucose levels. We're going to go over just a couple of these in a little bit of detail. So one of the long-term effects of insulin resistance is that our brains can also become insulin resistant. And we have sometimes uh, Alzheimer's can even be referred to as type three diabetes because one of the things that can be happening in Alzheimer's is that our brains can become insulin resistant. And then this affects our ability to learn and our memory. And since right now we are in the time of COVID, I wanted to discuss that with diabetes it has been found that people who have this are at a lot more increased risk of severe illness and are more likely to die. So especially right now, I think sometimes when we are faced with unhappy realities that it can hopefully um, find that fire within us to make different changes in our lives. Uh, the other thing that is common in long-term diabetes is something called peripheral neuropathy. And peripheral neuropathy is basically the periphery of our, our, of our body, our, like our legs, our feet, our hands, things that are towards the ends of our, our bodies. And often it's in the legs and the feet that our nerves get affected. And so we know that those glycated, heat, those glycated proteins, the damage that sugars do is it weakens our small blood vessels and it damages the nerves and the way they're able to send signals. And we know that even those advanced glycation end products also play a role in creating oxidative stress and affecting our nerves. So there's many, many different pathways. It's not just one pathway. And I think really that our body is very complicated and it's really a system. And so really when I'm thinking about health and I'm thinking about physiology and I'm thinking about how to help somebody improve that, really you're trying to think of the whole system and how all of those pieces really fit together and not just one thing. So that is why, which I'll talk about food, I told you I was gonna talk about vegetables a lot, you know, that things that why what we eat is actually so important. It's not one thing, it's all of those things that the information that we receive from our food is actually doing for our bodies. So here we have a little thing that's looking at uh, nerve dysfunction and death. So we have dyslipidemia, which is actually lipids, our cholesterol, hyperglycemia, which is what we're talking about here, and then also that insulin resistance. So there's slightly different pathways that are all affecting in that nerve dysfunction and death. And so back to that question, do you think you have to have diabetes before you might have some of these issues? And the answer is no, that even people with mild to moderate insulin resistance are actually at risk for some of these. It might take longer, they may not get the severity of symptoms, but they can actually, they will still have glycated hemoglobins. We all have glycated hemoglobins. Some of that is normal. Our body can deal with that. Our body has built 
tried to build in a lot of stock gaps. How can our bodies stay in this homeostasis, right? But what happens is over time, over the years, high normal glucoses definitely create damage to our body. So some of the signs that maybe some of this damage is starting to occur is that your blood pressure might be going up, your weight might be going up. Remember I mentioned that increased abdominal fat that helps starts to develop as we go uh, become insulin resistant. But really, we can't always tell by what's happening on the outside or even how we feel. We don't really get symptoms that we feel until we're pretty far advanced with the blood sugar. So really the best way to look at it is really to measure it in the blood. So we can look at that hemoglobin A1C that we talked about. There's a fasting glucose, which means before you've eaten, your blood sugar is checked. We often check a fasting insulin, which is that hormone that's bringing the blood sugar into the cell and a lipid panel, because we know that when blood sugars increase, we often see dysregulation in the cholesterol pathways as well. So what are you looking for? So a healthy blood glucose range is somewhere between 70 and 90, with very optimal being around 75. Honestly, I rarely see a blood sugar of 75. It's even, even in our patients who have really good diets, it's actually very challenging to keep our blood sugar in the optimal range. So uh, a lot of people don't even have that fasting blood sugar in that range. Um, healthy insulin is ideally 4.5 or less. Um, one thing I did put aside, but I, I'll, I'll pop in here, is that when our insulin levels get too high, it actually tells our body to lock our fat stores away. And that's one reason why we start to gain weight as we become insulin resistant. So I talk to a lot of people, usually women, who are having a really difficult time losing weight as they get older. And one of the first things I think about is looking actually at insulin resistance and where their insulin levels are. So uh, here's that hemoglobin A1C. So a healthy hemoglobin A1C is really at 5.6 or less. So if you've had blood work, you can compare your values to these. So when we're starting to get into that caution range of, okay, things are starting to change. Maybe I'm having a little bit of insulin resistance. We'll start to see those fasting glucose levels raise. Somewhere between 100 to 125 is considered prediabetes. And prediabetes is considered a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 to 6.4. Now here's really where we don't wanna get, and some of you may already be there and that's okay. We will talk a little bit about that as well. So to diagnose diabetes, you really need a blood sugar, of a, a fasting blood sugar of 126 or more on two different occasions, or a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 or higher on two different occasions. Sometimes you'll also start to see increased cholesterol, increased triglycerides, also starting to occur around the same time or maybe even preceding it. Some symptoms that you might have as you're going into actual diabetes are your hunger increases, you're thirsty all the time. Some people have weight loss and some people have weight gain. I mentioned that high insulin with weight gain, sometimes that will happen first and then weight loss may happen once you've already crossed into that threshold of diabetes. You might get really tired, uh, usually that, the, the tingling hands and feet, that's that peripheral neuropathy. That usually happens much later. Okay. So signs that you might have increased, we'll go over a couple of them. One is really that increased urination and thirst. I think that is usually one of the most telltale signs that you're having high blood sugar because really what your body's trying to do is balance out the glucose. You have too much glucose floating around in your body, and really what your body wants to do is dilute that. And so it's trying to put in more water and more water to bring your back body back into that place of homeostasis. Um, one way that elevated glucose damages the kidneys is it's trying to filter out all this high glucose. If it's very high, it'll get excreted out in your urine. And so a doctor may pick that up on a urine analysis. Originally how they used to diagnose diabetes before we had blood testing is from the taste of the urine. So it it's, doesn't sound like anything I'd like to do. So I'm really glad that we have tests to tell us if there's sugar in the urine. But they used to taste the urine. And when the urine was sweet, that was how they diagnosed diabetes. Okay. 
uh, also constant hunger. So when your body's just hungry, 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 it's like that glucose can't get in the cell. So you have all this blood sugar, it's floating around, but it's no longer able to get into the cell. And so what happens is we have a state of malnutrition in an overnutritioned person. So there's too much food, too much glucose, but it can't actually get into the cell so that our bodies can actually use any of that fuel. So how do we stop this progression from happening? We can eat real food. So I know you thought it was gonna be super complicated. And honestly, in a lot of ways, eating real food is complicated. So we're gonna talk about it, but um, it, shouldn't, it should actually be enjoyable. So I do want people to enjoy their food. So really to create stable blood sugar, what we wanna do is think about a plate and we want half our plate to be vegetables. We want a palm-sized version of protein, and everybody's palm is different, so you can use your palm as your judge because we're all different sizes. We want a decent amount of fat, healthy fat, so we'll go over that. And so we don't get bored and we can enjoy our food. I really like spices. They definitely have a lot of flavor. It doesn't have to be hot spicy, but you know, a lot of flavor so that you can really keep food different and enjoyable. Um, actually, if we eat the same thing over and over again, our body kind of becomes very used to it and it doesn't stimulate our brains in the same way. When we have new flavors and new tastes, it actually triggers the uh, neurotransmitter dopamine, which kind of is our reward and motivation. And so uh, as people do this diet, uh, sometimes I hear a lot like, oh, I just can't stick to it, or it's not, does it taste good, or I don't like those foods. And that's really where to me those spices come in because it can give you a lot of variety, keep that dopamine firing in your brain. So good, healthy protein and fat. So avocados, grass-fed, uh, ground beef, be, uh, steaks, lamb, we can do pastured eggs, wild fish, nuts and seeds. So all of these things are really good sources of protein. For healthy fat, so I grew up in that low fat era and I will say for a lot of my life, I was very afraid of fat and didn't really wanna eat it. And it really took a mind shift to realize that, oh, we do need fat. Our brains are made up of fat. We have fat in our skin, we have fat everywhere. We really do need these healthy fats, but we do want those fats to be healthy. So things like olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, grass-fed butter, nuts and seeds, olives, all of those things are really good sources of fat. And vegetables, I told you I'd talk about vegetables quite a bit. And really those vegetables are where we get most of our nutrients, our vitamins and minerals from is really coming from our vegetables and also our antioxidants. So I mentioned that a lot of these processes are causing this chronic inflammation. And one of the ways to help squelch that chronic inflammation is with antioxidants. And so on an oxidant, if you think about it like rust, so we've all seen metal rust and nail rust. So if you think about that process kind of happening in our bodies that our, if, our, if we have too much inflammation, it's almost like we're getting rusty inside. And so what fixes that rust are actually the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants that come from our highly colored fruits and vegetables. Those are really what help to repair that rust in our body. Another little trick, uh, especially if you are not quite to this diet yet, um, and especially if you're eating carbohydrates, because carbohydrates, remember, spike your blood sugar. So even things like brown rice will still spike your blood sugar. It might be slower, but it's still going to have a high glycemic effect compared to things like vegetables and protein. So if you have not yet got on that vegetable and protein diet, uh, then you can use apple cider vinegar. And we want to use the raw organic unfiltered apple cider vinegar. And if you haven't done this before, uh, you might look at the bottle and think it looks a little odd, and it does, but that is actually the good part. So what we want in that apple cider is the mother. And that mother is from that fermentation process and is those beneficial bacteria that are in the apple cider that we think are part of the reason why it works so well. So you can add that apple cider to a little water before you eat and it will actually support your digestion. It also, for blood sugar, slows down the absorption rate of those carbohydrates. You can also use it as food. So I'm always trying to figure out how to get more vegetables in there. So this is a dish I make all the time because it literally takes like two minutes to make. So I just cut up a cucumber, put some apple cider, a little olive oil so you have your healthy fats, some salt and pepper, and there you go. 
Now you have something that's going to help digestion, it's going to slow down any carbohydrates, and it tastes yummy. So really, you're trying to figure out how do we get all these vegetables in in a way that tastes good, that's easy, and that we can enjoy. Another food thing that we can do in order to stabilize our blood sugar and is a spice is cinnamon. So cinnamon, I love cinnamon because it also is feels like a treat, at least to me, <laughs> definitely is a treat. So a lot of times I can add cinnamon to something and then it just gives it, uh, it gives it a level of sweetness because uh, if you notice there was not sugar on that, on our plate. Um, and so sometimes cinnamon can give you a little bit of a sense of that sweet without having to put something on there that's gonna spike your blood sugar. And in fact, it's doing the exact opposite. It's actually supporting healthy blood sugar. Now, I am realistic, and I know that we are not going to go forever without having sweets. So I love this quote by Michael Pollan, and he says, there is nothing wrong with special occasion foods as long as every day is not a special occasion. Special occasion foods offer some of the great pleasures of life, so we shouldn't deprive ourselves of them, but the sense of occasion needs to be restored. And I really believe that. I don't expect people to never eat a sweet again. That's just not realistic. I can't do that. I can't ask someone else to do that. But we really need to bring back that sense of occasion, that a treat is a treat. And sometimes even those treats can be healthy. So we're gonna look a little bit about chocolate and the benefits of chocolate. So I will say I love chocolate and it is actually good for us or good chocolate, proper chocolate is good for us. So it can support healthy cholesterol levels by increasing our HDL, which the simple thing is HDL is happy, happy cholesterol, which is not that simple, but we'll just think about it that way for today. And it's gonna lower LDL, which a lot of you may have heard is the bad cholesterol. Not that simple, but we'll think about that today. Um, it contains um, healthy fats and it contains the right kinds of fats. So when we have a fat, it's a fat, fat is called saturated. Basically it means that there are no open bonds in the chemical structure. If a fat is monounsaturated, it has one, what's called a double bond, and one area where it can get oxidized. So if you remember, I talked about oxidative stress. Fats are one of the main things in our bodies that can get oxidized. So those fats, there's one double bond, a little bit of oxidation can happen. If it's a polyunsaturated fat, poly is many, there's many double bonds. That means there's many places on that fat where it can get oxidized, it's based where, basically where that fat can rust and then therefore require more antioxidants in order to combat that state of oxidation. So we know that chocolate doesn't really contain a lot of those polyunsaturated fats. So as far as the fat goes, it is definitely a healthy fat. It also has nutrition. There's minerals in there like iron, magnesium, and copper, manganese, and actually functionally, a lot of times what we say is people who are craving chocolate, usually they may be craving it for a reason. And I will say the number one thing that I think of is magnesium. Magnesium is one of the most common deficiencies and it's needed for over 300, 300 different chemical reactions in our body. So if you are craving chocolate, sometimes you might go, oh, why am I actually craving this? Sometimes there's a reason. Um, I mentioned that chocolate has a lot of antioxidants and one study showed that cacao, uh, so raw chocolate, contained more antioxidant activity and polyphenols than berries, which I know most of us think are very high in antioxidants, but chocolate actually contains even more. And those antioxidants help really to reduce those advanced glycation end products, which will then help reduce some of the sequelae of diabetes. Now, if someone actually has moved to full diabetes, they will have to check what, if their body handles regular chocolate or not. So I'm gonna talk about some different ideas for chocolate. So one of the things that you wanna look for is a 70% or more dark chocolate. The darker the chocolate, one, the more antioxidants, two, the less sugar you're gonna find in the rest of that chocolate. So ideally you wanna look for a chocolate that is 70% dark. And if you're not quite there yet, um, not I know as a society, most people, eat milk chocolate. And usually dark chocolate is more of an acquired taste. So if you're not to that 70%, jump up from where you are. Go from a milk chocolate to like a 50%, a 60%. And then you will see, typically our taste buds will adapt and you will actually start to really enjoy dark chocolate. I don't think I have found someone really yet 
who went blue from milk chocolate to dark over time that didn't end up liking it because what we give ourselves is what our body starts to really like. Sometimes we have to taste, change our taste buds just a little bit and it takes some time, but our taste buds really will change. So I did mention that for some people, even that 70% chocolate may be too high in sugar. So one way to know if you, especially if you already have diabetes, is you can eat some chocolate, take your blood sugar before, take your blood sugar half hour after, an hour after, two hours after. Our blood sugar should drop back down to the baseline level two hours after we've eaten. Sometimes it does, it should. In diabetes, it doesn't always. So you can see if you are diabetic, that's always a good way of seeing can I eat this food? Because really our body is our best guide. I can give you information, but everybody's body is slightly different. And so how your body responds is really what you wanna go by. So if your body is one that doesn't respond to that sugar very well, or you just don't want that sugar, um, there are brands out there that are made with stevia, erythritol, coconut sugar. So there are options out there that won't have that same blood sugar spike and you can still get the benefits of having that dark chocolate, both in health and in taste. So I did want to mention briefly that sugar is not the only thing that's hiding in our food. There's something called high fructose corn syrup. And a lot of products, most packaged products have turned to using high fructose corn syrup in them instead of actual sugar. And the reason is it's inexpensive. Unfortunately, it may even be worse for us than actual sugar. So we definitely wanna look for that if you're eating packaged foods, which ideally we would move away from packages and move towards whole foods. Um, ideally minimize cans, packages, you know, moving towards as many whole foods as we can. So one of the reasons why high fructose corn syrup is really not good for us is it actually goes straight to our liver to be processed. And one end result can be something called fatty liver. It can also do things like increase our uric acid, which can lead to gout, which is a painful joint condition. So then when we have that increased uric acid, it actually inhibits something called nitric oxide and nitric oxide vasodilates. It opens up our blood vessels and it helps keep our blood pressure low. So when we have uh, this increased uric acid, it creates a cascade. So pr most things in our body, pretty much everything, does not work in isolation. There's always a system. So often when we talk about things, it's hard to really look at that whole system. So I like to sometimes throw it in there. So that uric acid decreases nitric oxide and now our blood vessels are more constricted. And then we end up with things with high blood pressure. So, and then that high blood pressure can then affect our heart and lead to things like heart disease and heart attacks and strokes. So if you're interested in this, there's a great video on YouTube called Sugar the Bitter Truth. It's, it's a little long, it's about an hour, <laughs> um, but it's very interesting, definitely all about high fructose corn syrup. The other thing that sometimes people turn to when they're trying to avoid sugar is artificial sweeteners. And you know, one of the things that we have learned about artificial sweeteners is that they are really disrupting our gut microbiomes. And the largest part of our immune system is actually in our gut. And I mentioned earlier that we actually have more uh, DNA from our gut bacteria than we have human DNA. So these bacteria that live in us and on us are actually extremely important to our overall level of health. And we know that these artificial sweeteners are disrupting that. And even though there's no sugar and it's not necessarily affecting our glucose, we have found that these artificial sweeteners are actually contributing to weight gain. And I know they're actually usually touted to inhibit weight gain and calorie free, but they are definitely not health promoting substances. And sometimes they'll even try to hide things. So often we think of fructose as fruit sugar and it is, but it's when that fruit sugar becomes concentrated and now it's above the normal amount that would be naturally occurring in a fruit. And the other thing with a fruit is it has fiber that's gonna help slow down the absorption of that glucose. So I didn't really include fruit in here, but uh, I will say this too, is that sometimes people who have diabetes do great with fruit and sometimes they don't. And it's kind of like the, the sugar and chocolate. How much can your, your body handle? So you can do that same experiment with fruit that you do with chocolate. You take your blood sugar before, you eat some fruit, 
you take your blood sugar half hour after, an hour after, two hours after, actually until it goes back down to normal. See what your body does. How does your body respond? Is that a good item for you or not? So one of the other ways that they are trying to make something sound healthy is they'll then change the name. So rather than, a lot of people now know that high fructose corn syrup is not good for us, so now they're calling it crystalline fructose, and you will find this in some beverages. So when you see fructose in isolation on a product, it does not necessarily mean that it is better than sugar. So what can we do about some of this? Uh, so we can exercise. So there are studies that look at uh, brisk walking, even 30 minutes of brisk walking every day will cut your risk of diabetes in a third. So that is quite a bit for a half hour a day. And especially right now, a lot of us can't get to a gym. Maybe we're not going to our normal exercise classes, um, but hopefully we can get outside and walk when it's not too hot. Um, and if you do resistance training with a little bit of weight, actually improves, uh, cuts your diabetes risk as well. So another thing that we want to look at is dealing with our stress. So when we're under a lot of stress, it increases cortisol, and cortisol can increase our blood sugar levels. Um, and so when that happens, we end up having more food cravings, which then often when we're having cravings, that's really when we make, don't make good decisions about what we're eating. It can increase our abdominal fat. So once again, bringing that fat around the middle, and it can actually in and of itself lead to insulin resistance. It also affects the way that we sleep. And when we don't get an adequate sleep, that also affects our blood sugar. So really our body has many things that are all connected and correlated. So the way that the foods that we eat, our stress level, our sleep, our exercise, all of those things act independently on those overarching mechanisms. Another thing I wanted to bring up about sleep is snoring is it has been found that people who snore loudly, many of who actually have a condition called sleep apnea, where their oxygenation is going down in the night, have double the risk of developing diabetes, high blood pressure compared to quiet sleepers. So if you snore, that is definitely something to get checked out. Um, if you snore and you don't wake rested, the risk of developing diabetes increases to 70%. And if you snore loudly, and have a hard time falling asleep, your risk of developing diabetes actually raises to 80%. So we may not necessarily think of sleep and blood sugar as that connected, but really we have learned that sleep is our repair, our time our bodies repair itself. And so when our body is not able to repair, it ends up in this constant state of going, 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 and that contributes to many, many different diseases. So really trying to be assessed and see if you have sleep apnea can play a huge role in your body's ability to regulate glucose. And two, sometimes we see, so if people are doing a diet, they're like, I'm doing a diet, I'm exercising, I'm doing everything, and their blood sugars are still not coming down, sometimes we will screen them for sleep apnea because it can be a reason why people are not losing weight or their blood sugars are not regulating. So usually our body wants to be in balance. So if you're doing all the things right and it's not regulating, then you have to figure out, okay, something is still going on that is allowing the body to stay out of balance. Our natural state is to bring it back into homeostasis. And when that's not happening, we have to ask why. Why isn't that happening? What is, what's going on that is not allowing my body to go to its natural balance state? So ideally, we want you to get eight hours of high quality sleep per night. So really lifestyle is the foundation of health. So you know, and we can make those lifestyles fun. Um, even if we are limited in those things, we just have to be, be more creative right now. Um, you know, and Jessica, who's on, she has a great quote that you can't out supplement an unhealthy lifestyle. So really that diet, exercise, sleep, low stress or managing our stress, because no one can live stress-free, but it's really how we deal with that stress that is important. Those are really the foundation of health. Um, and I did want to talk about a couple supplements. So I will mention a couple things. Is one, there is a supplement called benfoshiamine. And what this is, is a lipid, salt, lipid version of thiamine, which is vitamin B1. And our B vitamins are how we get our energy from our food. 
And so one of the things that this particular form of thiamine does is it helps with those advanced glycation end products. So usually I think about this supplement, if you're someone who has had elevated blood sugar for quite a long time, maybe you have already some peripheral neuropathy, maybe you have some heart disease or something going on, this is when I definitely think of um, this benfotiamine. I also think about it when people are early on, they've maybe had insulin resistance for quite a while and they're just shifting over into diabetes to just protect that body. So I think of this when there's been long-term high blood sugar to really protect from um, those advanced glycation end products. And ideally, you know, we want to change the diet, but sometimes that takes time. Um, something that I didn't mention yet is that depending on how long someone's blood sugar has been elevated, so if I see a patient and they are in insulin resistance phase, almost always that can reverse. Diet, exercise, lifestyle, we see that reverse every day. If they're newly into diabetes, so they haven't had it for a long time, diet, exercise, lifestyle, I see it reverse all the time. Someone's had diabetes for a long time, honestly, they, those people will need to do the diet, lifestyle, and exercise. You cannot get by without not doing that, but they will need often a little bit more support that, that, that may or may, may or may not, depends on what's going on for that person and how far dysregulated their body has become. They often can, you know, I often will need to use other things in order to support uh, that body's coming back to homeostasis. This is one thing that we often will, will use to try to uh, inhibit the negative effects of having high glucose. The other thing, stumbling block that I often see for people are sugar cravings. Um, you know, they're trying to eat this good diet, you've got these vegetables, you got this protein, and you're just craving something sweet still because it takes a while for the glucose to get back into balance. And it takes a while for that insulin to come down and you're still craving, you're still in that blood sugar roller coaster, you're hanging on with your fingernails, right? Um, we've all been there. So that's when I think of something like D-ribose. D-ribose is actually a simple sugar, but it's not a sugar like glucose, it's a sugar for our cells. So it feeds our mitochondria, which are the parts of our cells that feed, that make our energy. So it doesn't raise blood sugar, it tastes sweet. A lot of times I'll use this um, for drinks. So if somebody's used to having some sugar in their coffee or sugar in their tea, um, that is a great use for this product. The other thing that I think of for sugar cravings um, is an herb called gymnema. Gymnema will in and of itself help support healthy blood sugar levels. Um, when you are using it for sugar cravings, you wanna use it in the liquid form. It is actually the taste of gymnema that when it comes into contact with your tongue, it actually suppresses your ability to taste sweet. It is an intense taste, I will tell you that. But if you're really craving, this is definitely a good thing to do. It is actually, it is great to help balance your blood sugar and it will it will kill your desire for that sweet, most definitely. So often one of the things that we like to do is help people or think about the roadblocks that people are coming up against when they're trying to change their diet, they're trying to exercise, you're trying to get the adequate amount of sleep, but maybe you can't fall asleep, you can't stay asleep. So often those are the types of things that we help our patients with. What kind of obstacles to cure are you coming up against and how can we best support your body so that it can return to that state of homeostasis? So I wanna thank you tonight for your attention. And um, if you would like to become a patient here, we do free consults. Um, over the phone. Um, and so you can text that to us um, at our number here. Also, if you'd like a copy of the slideshow, we can send you this. And I have some other materials, actually a couple chocolate recipes, uh, some information on how to increase vegetables, um, and a few things about general healthy diet that we will send to you if you are interested. Uh, we also have a mailing list so that if you're not already on it and are interested in uh, our lectures, we are trying to do at least one per month. We have many different topics uh, that you can definitely get on our email list to learn about the different uh, lectures that we have coming up. So I'm going to try now and find my button to see. Oh, and I just blacked out my screen. There we go. Oh, I think I just stopped sharing. Okay.
I was going to now try, let me go back here. I'm not very techy for those of you who know me. Uh, that's good. And I'm going to come here to the chat and see. Actually, I think I will stop sharing my screen. So I'm going to give you one more second in order to get that phone number down. And then I am going to stop sharing my screen so I can find my chat again. Dr. Nicole, as of right now, I don't see any questions. Um, oh, okay. So if anyone has any questions, they can send it over to the chat right now. Oh, here's my button. Okay. Oh, Mindy's asking how to get the slides. So um, if you text that number and you can write um, info and then we will send you a copy of the slideshow. So make sure to include your email so that we can um, get that slideshow to you. Okay, so someone is asking, with COVID, how safe is it to eat raw vegetables after people have rummaged through them at the store? So it is my understanding that if, say, somebody did have COVID, they touched themselves, um, and then they touched a produce with a decent amount of viral load, and then you take that home and you eat it raw. So one, you're usually washing it. Good chance that you will wash it off. Two, our stomach acid should actually kill the virus. Now, our stomach acid does deplete as we get older and maybe some people may not have that adequate defense. So um, I would say by washing it, honestly, I think the chance of getting COVID from raw vegetables, from what I understand about how the, co the virus is spread is pretty minimal. So really when I'm thinking about the risk of getting this virus, I'm thinking about time of exposure and level of viral load that someone's exposed to. And obviously there is the susceptibility of the person as well. So, you know, we all want to get to a point where we can feel like we're living a somewhat normal life while staying safe. And everybody's level, I think, of doing that is going to be very different. There's a great blog um, where he uh, talks a lot about the science behind um, transmission. And his name is Aaron Bromage, E-R-I-N. I believe his last name is B-R-O-M-A-G-E. He has a really great blog where he talks about, he's an immunologist, um, where he talks about um, what to think about and maybe things to think about when you're really risking what your level of safety may need to be. Okay, so now there's more questions. Okay. Um, okay, someone asked, to be a patient, do you need to live in the area or can it be online virtual? Um, what is that answer? So right now, technically, I think we can do things Virtually, typically we have, typically what we have done is wanted to meet somebody in person at least once. Um, Jessica, do you know where we're at with that right now? Um, right now we can do all virtual appointments um, and telemedicine. Okay. Um, and we do free consults too. So if you wanted to just check out a free consult with Dr. Nicole, you can text that number consult and then her, you and you guys can talk about your specific information. Great. Um, so someone's asking, let's see, how does eating more fat than sugar affect the pancreas? And you know, do I know? I mean, so our pancreas basically, it has the beta cells, which have to do with insulin and it creates enzymes, which help us digest fat. I'm not quite sure where you're going with that question. Um... So I'm not sure quite how to answer that. And maybe you're thinking about, uh, so I think I mentioned very briefly that often, or depending on someone's cir circumstances, there's a diet called the ketogenic diet. And in that ketogenic diet, rather than using glucose for fuel, you're using fat for fuel. 
And that fat basically goes straight to the liver to be turned into energy. Um, and that kind of energy is actually, it's a little, it's a slower burning energy than glucose. Uh, so it feels a little bit different. We call that when somebody is able to get into that state, it's called fat adapted. Um, and maybe, I don't know, honestly, I don't know the effect on the pancreas. I'm going to have to look that up and double check. Okay, so here's someone asking, if I build muscle by bodybuilding, will the increased muscle absorb the sugar in my blood? They are suggesting I start building more muscle to reverse prediabetes. So muscle cells are known to be good things for glucose. So I do believe that's why the study on weight resistance um, actually lowered the risk of developing diabetes. I think it has to do with the way that the muscle cells um, utilize glucose. So this person is saying, I don't think the stomach acid will help if it gets in your mouth and nasal tract. I am a nutritionist and food scientist. Please wash your raw veggies. Well, I believe I did say usually we wash our raw veggies. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I don't usually, so I think the last study that I read was that when you eat the food, it should not transmit virus. Now, if you touch your nose, that is definitely a, an orifice that will transmit the virus. Um, so someone's asking, I recently had a full blood test. What do I need to look at when it comes to knowing if my blood sugar is too high or borderline for prediabetes? So that prediabetes range is 100 to 125 fasting, or what is that? A1C, I think it's 5.7 to 6.4. I have to check my slides. We actually like to get hemoglobin A1Cs much lower than that. Um, so it's, uh, their numbers are not usually, honestly, what I go by. So I'm going to, yeah, 5.7 to 6.4 is prediabetes. Uh, someone's asking, do you think high fructose syrup operates dif differently in the body than agave? Um, the mouth, Okay, so agave is actually, so the reason agave is low glycemic index is because it's high in fructose. So I do not believe it's as high as high fructose corn syrup, but it is still high in fructose. And therefore agave is for me, not one of my favorite sweeteners. We realized I didn't put a lot in here about good sweeteners. The sweeteners that I do like is I like stevia. Um, for some people, there is an aftertaste with stevia. One of the things that um, I like is there's a product called Sweet Leaf. And the sweet leaf is stevia that's cut with inulin. And inulin is a prebiotic, which is food for our probiotics, our beneficial bacteria. And when it's cut like that, you don't get that same negative aftertaste that you do when you're using straight stevia, which can definitely be a little bit intense. So I am a fan of that sweet leaf. Um, not everyone can tolerate sweet leaf. So uh, if people have certain digestive conditions, um, specifically something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that inulin in the sweet leaf will actually make them feel worse in their gastrointestinal system. Um, I also don't mind the sugar alcohols like erythritol and xylitol. Um, they are actually pretty good sweeteners. Xylitol has actually been shown to, like when you, they make xylitol gum, it actually helps reduce cavities. Um, so there are actually some benefits to something like xylitol. Um, now, if you eat too much of any sugar alcohol, it can lead to a negative gastrointestinal outcome, um, i.e. diarrhea. So you don't want to eat too much of it, but we shouldn't be eating too much of it anyways. Um, some people might be more sensitive than others, but usually people do pretty well with a little bit of those. Um, someone's saying the mouth is connected to the nasal passage. You know, I mean, I know when COVID first came out, there was a lot of uh, questioning about how we really got it. Um, and I'd say what, what seems like has really panned out in the research is that it's really the respiratory droplets. So, and that is both large and small respiratory droplets. So coming from um, talking, coughing, sneezing, singing, you know, something kind of being expelled is I would say that is the number one reason. Can you get it another way? Yes. 
I mean, really almost anything in the world is possible, right? So it can happen. But I also don't want to have so much fear around it that it's creating a sense of increased stress. On my way here, I was listening to the radio and they were talking about college students and the level of depression that they're now seeing in college students is basically, I can't remember how, it's gone up more than any other time that have been studied. So yes, this virus is there, it's real, it's intense, it can have significant and obviously deadly consequences. So I think the thing is to always look at each person and each situation independently. So if somebody has diabetes, you know what, they need to maybe take more precautions. If somebody, you know, so really we need to each assess our risk, assess our comfort level, assess our stress level. To me, it's not always black and white and one thing. So we really need to take a look at the whole picture. Um, and someone's asking if, what insurance we take. Uh, so unfortunately, we do not take insurance for our services. Um, if someone has a PPO, we can do things um, with that as well. So someone's saying studies show it li lives on food as well as hard surfaces. And it can live on food and hard surfaces. There is a time frame to that. So in optimal conditions, I believe it will live on stainless steel, which I believe is the longest thing for three days. So we also want to take a look at the science and really look at each individual thing. So if someone's worried about food, uh, you know, say like an apple, an apple is something that we often eat raw, maybe you rotate your apple. So you buy some apples, push your new, put your new ones in the back, put your uh, ones that you've had for more than three days to the front. So sometimes we just want to think about what we're doing and not, um, you know, just have some thought process and, and, and think that all the way through. So, and I think, you know, there's many different ways of thinking about it and not being reactionary in our thought. I think that a lot of times, especially honestly in medicine, um, there's a lot of reaction. And I guess the way that I always want to try to think about it is I want to think about it from a holistic perspective. And I want to try to think about as many of those moving parts as I can for each individual person. And so what may be the right answer for one is, may not be the right answer for someone else. So we really want to take into account that individuality and really looking at all of the options. So, okay. We got another one. How safe is takeout food? And I'd say with takeout food is kind of a similar thing. Um, you know, obviously the food is cooked, but somebody touched it. They may have touched the container. So depending on someone's risk level, you know, really the biggest way the virus gets into us is by touching our nose and our mouth with an infected particle. So, you know, really trying to keep that in mind, um, you know, and think about what for you is going to be important. And, you know, I had another patient ask a question whether she should go do something the other day. And honestly, I can't, I'm not here to make decisions for anybody. I think really just going back to the science and to your risk level and your feeling of safety. And that is, I think, the best of, best answer for yourself is what are you okay with? Read the science, think what, what, um, what makes sense for you, think of your risk factor, and then that is to me how to answer some of those questions. So. Good. Uh, I think that was the last one. Let me double check. Good. Okay. Yeah, I know it's a really hard time now with COVID and I think trying to really find some sort of balance and things that are nourishing to us. And, you know, I think food can be very nourishing. And I think having that attitude where it is nourishing and supporting our bodies, um, you know, what we put in our bodies, both mentally and physically, I think is, is very, very important. So uh, I think really early on we did, um, we did quite a few COVID town halls. And one of the things that really clicked and made sense for me was that 
I do not want to live my life in fear. So I am safe, I'm socially distanced, I'm the only one here in my office, I'm working from home, we're doing all telemedicine, you know, we're taking many, many precautions. But if I live in that state of fear, then really what I'm doing is I'm setting myself up for inflammation and chronic disease. And so trying to find that space, that place where we can find a source of happiness or contentness, even in this really uncontented world right now. So what can we do to be positive, support our bodies, support our health, support other people, and find that what we're okay with? Um, and then that answer is going to be different for each person. So, good. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank all of you for spending your Tuesday evening here with us. And um, I had recognized some of those names and some of them I don't recognize. Maybe I'll recognize you in the future. So I hope that um, you all stay healthy and well and happy. Thank you so much. Take care.